Um, I'm Robert Niblett, the director of Chatham House, Royal Institute of International Affairs. We're very pleased to be strategic uh, partners this year for the Doha Forum 2019. Um, and uh, I'm thrilled uh, to have the opportunity to moderate uh, this opening panel on reimagining governance in a multipolar world, the title of the entire forum. Um, and we've got a wonderful panel here to help us uh, have a good conversation around this topic, um, which is big and vast. Um, if I can say a couple of words of introduction for it, just to, so our speakers, uh, our panelists can get in the mood for this topic, what I would say is um, it sounds positive, reimagining uh, governance in a multipolar world, but I seem to remember that multipolar world and multilateralism doesn't go very well together. And in the old days, multipolarity, another word for it, was balance of power. Um, once you've got different poles, they start competing with each other. Um, I think we had a mention a few minutes ago from Professor Tijani uh, Mohamed Banda, who had come from Madrid and the COP25. We can see there what happens when countries compete over big global challenges rather than necessarily think about how they can do them together. Um, so what we want to discuss today is how do you engage diverse voices um, and make sure that a multipolar world is one that is inclusive rather than one that is a back to the future of a kind of 19th or 20th century type of politics. Because as this forum has made very clear, the challenges we face, uh, climate change, migration, uh, the rise of new technologies are going to require new forms of global cooperation. So what I'm going to do, uh, first of all, is turn to uh, Sheikh Mohammed bin Abdurrahman Al Thani, um, one of the hosts of this uh, forum uh, this year, uh, Deputy Prime Minister and Foreign Minister for nearly four years. I think in January it'll be four years, and give him the opportunity maybe to answer a first question. And I will say to each of our panelists, we will try to have questions and be uh, sharp in our answers, and so I can take a few questions or comments from our distinguished participants and guests here as well today. Um, Sheikh Mohammed, if I could start with you, for a small state, Qatar is a small state, maybe a powerful state, but a small state, um, is a multipolar world better? Is this one that you're enjoying being inside? Or is it one in which you feel that uh, the security risks are becoming more intense? Um, and one that is harder for a small state to navigate. Um, should we feel positive about a multipolar world, or is it one that you are anxious about uh, in the state of Qatar? If I could turn to you first. First of all, thank you very much. I would like to welcome everybody uh, who is participating with us this year in, in Doha Forum, and I wish you a fruitful uh, participation here and uh, we can engage together and Doha Forum is, is a platform for dialogue and for engagement between different uh, parties and different countries and what we are looking at uh, this year is, is the challenges in the multipolar world and how we can address the issue of governance in, in that world. For us, uh, as a small state, uh, you just mentioned which is better for us. Is it a unipolar or a multipolar? Small states, actually, uh, even they don't decide on uh, the land about the landscape of the world, whether it's a unipolar or multipolar. But what we really need, we need to address the challenges, whether it's a unipolar or a multipolar. And we believe that the best way to address these challenges is really to address the multilateral governance that we've been living in uh, in the last uh, 74 years. Uh, since, uh, since after the World War II, uh, we believe the world has changed. And the world order since that time and the establishment of, of the United Nation uh, has shown that some of the mechanisms has worked and some didn't work. And I think we need to take a step back and assess what worked and how we can improve it and what didn't work and how can we address it. Uh, there are three things that we need to focus on that for all the states, sovereignty needs to be respected, uh, national and international interests need to be protected, and striking the balance between uh, the national and the international interest. And third, that all the countries and all the parties are, are engaged in the same manner 
toward prosperity and, and development. So uh, if we are going to look at these challenges uh, uh, around us these days, we see that uh, the nature of, of the challenges has changed and has evolved since uh, uh, in the last decades. We have seen a complexity in, in these challenges, whether it's uh, if we are thinking about wars and conflicts, the nature of war has changed from the uh, traditional regime of warfare to cyber warfare, economic manipulation, drones, uh, transnational terrorism. All these challenges are, are new to, uh, to, the order, to the world order, which was established a long time ago. So we believe that there is a great importance that all the countries need to be engaged and to look at the best governance system, how we can balance between uh, uh, the national and international interest, which we believe this is one of the reasons why we see some big countries are, are uh, leaving the multilateral system and departuring from it. And we need to make sure that all the countries also have the same and equal rights, but also equal responsibility. Uh, but uh, if we want really to build a strong governance, uh, a global governance system, and if we want to do this global reform, we need to address the grassroots. And we need to look at our regional systems. Uh, and to build strong regional uh, coherence, where we can uh, start bottom-up building uh, a consensus in, in, in the multilateral system, where we have some good examples that made a good progress and success. Among them is, is the African Union, which we believe is one of uh, successful regional examples. We have others where it has been over-regulated sometimes, which made some uh, decisions like what UK took uh, uh, to leave uh, in the EU. In, in the Middle East, uh, we have our regional uh, framework, which showed that didn't work. In, uh, in the last decades, and we have seen that the challenges and, and, and the problems are just continuing, and we see more and more conflicts. So uh, I believe there should be a holistic approach for what's, what's happening. We need to address our regional multilateral cooperation, and then also address the global multilateral cooperation. So a very important point that uh, if you're going to have a, a multilateral form of governance, you need to have strong regions and strong components uh, in it as well. So perfect opportunity for me to turn to <coughs> Mr. Uh, Musa Faki uh, Muhammad. Uh, Mr. Muhammad, you're a chairperson of the African Union uh, Commission, um, and the African Union is playing a, a much more active role, or certainly has been in the last uh, five to 10 years. When one thinks of a multipolar world, uh, Africa historically in recent years uh, has been a, a field of competition, whether colonial competition, uh, bipolar competition in the Cold War. Um, is regionalism, being able to come together and create strong regional institutions, part of the answer, in your opinion, to the kind of multipolar world we're in? Is this what African states are trying to do, give a stronger voice to each other by grouping together? And if so, uh, is it working? What are the challenges you face as the chairperson of this commission? Uh, merci beaucoup. Euh, Permettez-moi d'abord de remercier le Qatar, l'émir du Qatar, le gouvernement et le peuple pour leur accueil et les organisateurs de ce forum qui est devenu une plateforme des plus respectées pour discuter des questions internationales. Comme c'est ma première participation, permettez-moi de me féliciter euh, de cet achèvement qui est formidable. Ce qui a été imaginé après la Seconde, la seconde Guerre mondiale comme modèle de gouvernance mondiale et de multilatéralisme, notamment à travers la mise en place de l'Organisation des Nations Unies, a été en son temps un pas positif. Mais 75 ans après, nous constatons que tout a changé. Le monde a changé, la nature des défis a changé, la nature des opportunités a changé, l'Afrique a changé. Je vais me situer dans la perspective de l'Afrique. L'Afrique constitue aujourd'hui plus du quart des membres des Nations Unies. Qu'il s'agisse de la paix, qu'il s'agisse du développement économique, qu'il s'agisse des changements climatiques, la place de l'Afrique n'est pas entièrement reconnue. Et ce qui est extrêmement grave, 
sur la question de la paix. Plus de 60 à 70 des dossiers qui sont sur la table du Conseil de sécurité des Nations Unies sont des questions africaines. Le modèle ancien des opérations du maintien de la paix a montré ses limites. On l'a constaté au Congo, en RDC, où depuis plus de 60 ans, les Nations Unies sont présentes. Nous le constatons plus récemment au Mali, en République centrafricaine et ailleurs. La nature du défi a changé. L'Afrique aujourd'hui n'a pas de problème entre ces États. Les problèmes sont le terrorisme, la criminalité transfrontalière et le trafic de tout genre. Notre constat est que le point de vue de l'Afrique, de l'Union africaine, n'est pas pris en compte. Nous avons une stratégie, nous avons un agenda pour pouvoir traiter de toutes ces questions, mais nous peinons à les faire accepter par la communauté internationale. Il y a cinq membres permanents au Conseil de sécurité. Un seul peut prendre une décision qui bloque une décision pour 1,2 milliard d'habitants, c'est le nombre de la population africaine. Ça, ce sont des inepties. Il est absolument nécessaire de revoir la gouvernance mondiale. Il est nécessaire de tenir compte des organisations régionales qui sont reconnues d'ailleurs par, par la Charte des Nations Unies. En son chapitre 8, elle pense que les organisations régionales ont un rôle, ont un rôle à jouer, ce qui n'est malheureusement pas le cas. Nous avons pu, en tant qu'organisation continentale, régler pas mal de problèmes. En RDC, en Centrafrique, au Soudan tout récemment, une médiation africaine a pu régler le problème et permettre à ces pays de rentrer dans un processus démocratique très populaire. Par ailleurs, je prends un exemple qui est fort décourageant, c'est celui qui se passe en Libye. Les forces internationales sont intervenues en Libye, l'OTAN, le pays depuis huit ans et dans le chaos total. Et l'on ne permet pas à l'organisation dont appartient la Libye, à savoir l'Union africaine, de contribuer à la solution. Le problème de la Libye se traite en Europe, il se traite aux États-Unis, il se traite ailleurs, alors que l'Afrique a des mécanismes qui puissent lui permettre d'aider à la résolution de ces problèmes, parce qu'elle n'a aucun agenda si ce n'est celui de la paix et de la stabilité d'un de ses pays membres. Ça, c'est quelque chose qui est extrêmement grave. Dans le domaine économique, Aujourd'hui, le continent africain, c'est 1,2 milliard d'habitants, c'est 30 millions de kilomètres carrés, c'est des ressources naturelles immenses. Cette population est constituée à plus de 60 à 70 de jeunes de moins de 25 ans. C'est la force de travail, c'est un marché important. Nous avons lancé il y a six mois la zone de libre-échange continentale, qui est le plus grand marché, que le plus grand marché au monde. Malgré toutes ces potentialités, les règles sont définies par quelques États qui imposent les règles et qui les appliquent. Comment, dans ces conditions-là, peut-on parler d'une gouvernance mondiale, d'une multipolarité Il faut absolument... C'est la même chose sur le plan climatique. Nous ne sommes pas des pollueurs, nous sommes plutôt les victimes de la pollution. Alors, sur tous ces chemins, il y a une nécessité de revoir. Le contexte actuel appelle à ce qu'on revoie toutes ces certitudes et que l'on revienne à quelque chose de plus juste, de plus inclusif, à même de ramener la paix et la prospérité pour tous. Sinon, on ouvre le chemin de boulevard pour la violence, pour la déstructuration sur le plan de la paix, sur le plan économique et sur le plan social. Et c'est ça est regrettable. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mohamed. Those are powerful words. I think your, your comment that 70% uh, you know, of the challenges on the UN agenda are relevant to Africa, and yet Africa does not have a voice in all of the UN institutions that uh, should therefore permit it uh, is a very powerful one for us to hear, especially when we talk about more inclusive forms of governance. Um, and maybe, uh, Jane Harmon, it's appropriate that I turn to you now, though I don't want to make you have to carry the whole burdens of US foreign policy. Um, but as uh, director, president, CEO of the Wilson Center and a former nine-term member of the U.S. Congress, you know the U.S. system particularly well. Whenever anyone talks about changing systems of governance, it generally starts with whether the U.S. wants to carry the burdens uh, of hegemony and of world leadership or not. Um, and I think for many people in the world, we seem to be stuck 
between two environments, one in which the U.S. is sort of pulling back, certainly under this administration, and focusing more on itself, but at the same time not wanting to let go of the power that comes with being a leader of institutions, a, a veto in the UN Security Council, etc. So, I mean, if I can ask you, is, have we entered a new normal, in your opinion, of US foreign policy, that it's going to be more about itself, uh, and therefore, uh, if it is more about itself, does it leave room for other countries to step up, or is it going to be America going to be uh, trying to hold on to what it's got, if you see what I'm saying, in the UN Security Council and all of the privileges that come with it? Well, thank you, Robin. Uh, first of all, on the subject of inclusive, uh, let me say how proud I am to be part of an all-woman delegation from the United States, including uh, former ambassador to Qatar, uh, Maureen Quinn, and uh, former special advisor to President Bush and former deputy national security advisor, now head of the North American part of the Trilateral Commission, Megan O'Sullivan. And let me also say how proud I am tomorrow to uh, release a, uh, a report by the Wilson Center called Ready for Work, an Analysis of Workforce Asymmetries in the Middle East and North Africa, prepared with uh, generous support of the government of Qatar. Thank you very much. On this subject, um, maybe I could make, make a historical point and then answer the question directly. My historical point is, that the Berlin Wall came down on November 9th, 1989, and the, uh, the day the Soviet Union was dissolved was November 26th, 1991. These events occurred three decades ago, and that is when we should have been asking this question. Uh, the Cold War ended, and America assumed we would be the sole superpower in the world, and that hasn't worked out so well. Uh, I would say that we wasted, uh, part of the world was with us, the decade of the 90s missing the terror threats that were so obviously rising. We were surprised by 9-11, and what we should say to this audience is, the really good news is, after that catastrophic attack, uh, NATO invoked Article 5 for the only time in its history, the common defense provision, and our allies here came to our support. Even Iran offered support. Sadly, what happened was our response was mostly on war footing. Looking back on it, I was there for all of this, so I, I share blame or credit for what happened. But a war on terror is a war on a tactic. It is not, it, it, it plays into the, the bad guy's playbook rather than ch seeing what these uh, uh, what, what this, this menace was really about. What was it about? Let's face this. It was about lack of inclusiveness, lack of opportunity, poor governance, the disconnect between our education systems and jobs, things that every one of us understands. So now, you asked, what should the United States be doing? My view, as a former member of the United States Congress and someone who leads a nonpartisan uh, think tank that uh, focuses, I hope, fairly on world issues, including the Middle East, my answer is the United States should not retreat, but we should join uh, revital, uh, an effort to revitalize all of our alliances, including the United Nations. The point about Africa is right. Uh, we have an Africa Institute at the Wilson Center. Africa is undervalued, given its enormous contributions and the fact that 50% of the growth in the world uh, in the next two decades will come from Africa. Uh, how are we going to deal with this as a world? How are we going to deal with what happens if we don't deal with it, which is more, even more horrible migration issues? So uh, the U.S. should be on the team. We should be inclusive. Uh, we should recognize that issues like climate change have to be on the agenda. We should be more humble. And I think, in the end, the multipolar world we should have recognized 30 years ago will be a better world for having the United States as one member of a very valued and inclusive team. Jane, as you are very efficient on your time, and there's one voice that is not on this panel, can I just tack one little question onto you before I come to Borge Brende, which is um, we might end up in, if we're reimagining governance in two or three years' time, in a world that rather than being multipolar is seen as bipolar. 
um, huge debate in the United States, including in the trade agenda, on what kind of a relationship the United States will have with China. And obviously this will affect everyone, every country on this panel uh, represented here, uh, how it goes there. Do you see this uh, kind of bipolar competition as inevitable? Because if it is, it affects everything that we discuss here. Or do you think it's, there's going to be possibility for some type of uh, accommodation between these two big powers? Well, the, the recent uh, national security strategy in the United States has turned away from f sole focus on counterterrorism, which is still a big problem, but now identifies China and Russia as strategic competitors. They are strategic competitors, but that doesn't mean they have to be enemies. Each brings different strengths. Str China is probably, uh, for any number of reasons that everyone here understands, the longer term uh, issue. But certainly my personal view, and I know the view of the scholars and, and, and policymakers at the Wilson Center, and our, our Kissinger Institute on China and the US, led by Henry Kissinger, is that the challenge is to make China a friendly competitor. And I don't think it's inevitable uh, that we will be enemies, and I surely don't think war is inevitable. And on a challenge that everyone knows is coming, uh, a technological challenge, 5G, it would be a tragedy if China formed one communication system and the United States insisted on a different one. That would not help our national security and it would certainly not help uh, our economy. And good news today is that uh, President Trump and President Xi have agreed, in principle anyway, on a trade deal that will roll back some of the tariffs that have spooked international markets. Thank you very much. Uh, let me uh, turn now to Borger Brende, President of the World Economic Forum. Um, formerly Foreign Minister of Norway and Trade Minister and Environment Minister, a uh, number of key positions uh, in the Norwegian government. So, uh, Borge, you get to see the world from two uh, different perspectives, but I think you're carrying somewhat here, certainly as I'm moderator, the European flag um, on this uh, panel. Though interestingly, obviously Norway not being a member of the EU, but very closely connected and aligned, uh, Europe I think always thought that it was reimagining governance, that it was the vanguard of a different structure and way for uh, governments to interact and give an opportunity for their citizens to be more engaged. Um, is, is the EU ready for this more multipolar world? Can it organize itself? And do you think European nations, those also connected to it, uh, can form a pole? Will they be a pole? Or is that like anti what Europe is about and therefore it's always going to be suffering, always one step behind and maybe not such a good partner as a result? Thank you, uh, Robin. Um, thank you to Sheikh Mohammed also for um, your hospitality here. I think you have um, a very good point that uh, the new president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, has outlined this vision of maybe EU becoming a kind of G3. If you're talking about the G2, uh, US and China, uh, Europe uh, can uh, then underline European values and can also be someone filling a vacuum. This multipolar world uh, is maybe still kind of a apolar world. I think uh, there is a huge vacuum created and we don't know what this vacuum is going to be filled with. Um, from the World Economic Forum side, uh, we of course hope that this vacuum will be filled with a um, kind of multi-stakeholder approach where we bring also in so, uh, civil society, also business together. I think we can achieve more uh, together. But at the same time, I hope that this vacuum uh, is not uh, filled uh, with only a national focus, but is also filled with a focus where we are faced with integrated challenges, common challenges, like climate change, trade, and our approach now uh, is much more of a fragmented approach. And that is a huge, huge question, uh, uh, challenge. We said that we are moved from kind of a cold war, but I think that what we have moved from is like from cold war to hot peace. And we may, we have to make sure that um, we all underline uh, what also Prime Minister of Malaysia said, uh, you should not beggar your neighbor, 
but you should prosper your neighbor. I think that was uh, very well said. And for me, this notion of trade wars is something very unfamiliar. Trade is not a weapon. Trade is the key to prosperity. And since 1990, we have doubled the global GDP. We have reduced the amount of people in the world living in extreme po poverty from 42% to 12%. At the same time, we have increased global trade three to four times. So trade is the key to prosperity if you get it right. If you get it right, but as you said, uh, trying to get that balance right at the moment is incredibly difficult. Um, and if I could just take you back to the, to the European element, do you think Europeans can be uh, drivers, certainly in the last uh, year or two, the one part of the world that has really driven a number of trade agreements with Japan, with Vietnam, with Singapore, has been the EU. Hopefully, actually, there are some agreements done with groups of uh, sub-Saharan African states as well. Do you feel Europe is, is kind of fighting a battle to try to keep multilateralism open? And if it is, are you optimistic about its capacity to do so? I think there is no alternative to multilateralism. It is no uh, being um, indirectly questioned, but if you have common challenges, you have to deal with them at the right level. And uh, there, I think, the United Nations and all the multilateral institutions that we have built are still uh, the right ones, but they also have to reform, as also addressed uh, by the, the chairperson of the African uh, Union. When it comes to the European Union, um, I think the European Union uh, can uh, be initiating also rules in areas uh, where we need traffic rules and rules. We are emerging into this fourth industrial revolution. World Economic Forum has worked a lot on this, but with all the new technologies that are gonna change our lives so profoundly, we have very limited traffic rules. We have, um, private superpowers that have um, huge uh, influence. Um, I think we in such a world also need uh, traffic rules and I think the European Union can maybe not uh, overnight uh, be um, the foremost force when it comes uh, to these new, new companies, even if they're working on that. But I think the European Union can set standards that uh, will also inspire uh, the rest of the world. Of course, what the EU is faced with is also internal uh, discussions that sometimes take a lot um, of uh, their energy, but provided that the EU can look also more outside and focus on the EU leadership, I think we can also see a more influential EU moving forward. Thank you very much, Borge. Sheikh Mohammed, if I can come back to you, um, we'll take another five, seven minutes and then try and get a few questions in before we lose our, our slot here. Um, climate change has come up several times, and for a country like Qatar, which is obviously heavily involved in uh, the energy business, um, built a lot of its, well, the bulk of its wealth off the back of it, where do you see the governance element of this going? Where does Qatar sit in these debates? as are taking place right now in COP25 uh, in Madrid. Uh, are your voices as incorporated as those of others? How would you want to reimagine in governance, governance towards climate change from the perspective of an energy producing, an oil and gas producing country? How, how are your viewpoints gonna be incorporated um, at a time when other countries obviously have perhaps very different perspectives as to how it should play out? How are you managing that dilemma as the, as the leader of, of a small country that's hugely influential in the energy space. Well, uh, regarding the challenge of, of the climate change, uh, we believe that uh, the way to characterize it in, in different countries and uh, whether it's at the highest priority or less priority because of, of other touching concerns is different. So Qatar as an energy producer country uh, Part of our national agenda and, and one main pillar of our national vision is to have a sustainable development which makes sure that we are not affecting uh, the environment, whether in Qatar or we are not affecting the global ch uh, such a global challenge like, like the climate change. So uh, in, all, in the entire value chain of our energy production, we make sure that we are 
uh, environmentally friendly. We develop uh, and working together with other companies in, in, in the highest technology. But when it comes to a multilateral debate about climate change and what kind of commitments countries can take, Qatar is, is working in, in very close cooperation with like-minded countries, with uh, countries with similar characters, in order to make sure that our voice is heard. We cannot uh, have uh, just speak ourselves, but also we have to be part of the world commitment uh, in the climate change. And we have done uh, trying our best to contribute uh, to the effects of, of the climate change, especially for small states and small islands. His Highness, this year during the General Assembly, he has uh, done a new pledge for uh, in the Green Fund. And we are working uh, in different multilateral mechanisms to make sure that these uh, challenges are addressed in the same way our development is, go is progressing in the same pace. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Mohammed. if I could bring one question to you about technology. Um, as you noted, Africa, a huge young population, um, going to have to find work, find jobs uh, very quickly, industrialization, a very competitive space. Do African nations have a su significantly or sufficiently large voice in the development of technology, technology standards? Um, can the, is the African Union putting the development of technology at the heart uh, of its thinking. You mentioned the African free trade area. Uh, to what extent are you worried that you will have to end up being consumers of other people's rules of technology, which will hugely affect uh, how Africa develops? Uh, and how are you trying to get a voice in on the big technology debates, not just leaving it to the EU, the US, uh, China, et cetera? Uh, effectivement, à l'heure de l'intelligence artificielle, il faut absolument qu'un continent comme l'Afrique rentre dans cette révolution. Et des efforts sont faits, malgré le retard qui s'explique sur le plan historique. Je pense que ne pas tenir compte de l'Afrique a été et est une erreur historique et même une erreur stratégique. J'ai dit que des efforts sont faits et je suis heureux de voir en face de moi le président Kagame, qui est parmi les leaders africains, qui a mis la question du développement technologique de la science parmi ses priorités. Un pays comme le Rwanda, aujourd'hui, est un exemple dans les nouvelles technologies. Et je crois que ces efforts vont, vont, vont continuer. Il faut éviter de considérer le continent africain comme juste un réservoir de matières premières. Nous avons des partenariats avec tout le monde. L'Union européenne, les États-Unis, la Chine, le Japon, le monde arabe, la Turquie et tous les autres. Nous aurions souhaité, nous aurions souhaité d'être traités sur le même pied d'égalité et... On ne peut pas négliger un continent qui, en 2100, va comprendre 40% de la population du monde et la plus jeune. Donc la force de travail est là, le marché est là et il serait suicidaire de continuer dans cette pratique d'isolationnisme, d'hégémonisme et ne pas pouvoir donner sa chance à tout le monde. On ne demande pas de l'aide, on, on ne demande que notre place dans la gouvernance internationale, plus de justice, plus d'équité. La question technologique est aujourd'hui au centre de l'agenda africain. Il faut absolument que les, les, les partenaires, il faut que dans le cadre de la gouvernance internationale, que cette question-là soit à la portée de tous. Elle permet de mieux gérer la croissance démographique, elle est à même de mieux régler les défis économiques, et elle est à même de régler les problèmes de paix et de stabilité. Parce que si vous avez des milliards de gens qui n'ont aucune perspective, c'est la porte ouverte à tous les dérapages. C'est ça, donc l'éducation, la formation professionnelle et surtout les sciences et les technologies doivent être une préoccupation pour tout le monde et partagée. La gouvernance mondiale aurait à gagner peut-être en rendant justice à la majorité en procédant ainsi. Thank you very much. Now, look, I do want to take some questions and I can uh, get Borge, um, Brende, and Jade Harman back in as well as others. And I think I can see the audience fairly well here. There are microphones around the room, I've been told. So why don't we see if we can get two or three comments in? You're going to have a very active day coming forward. I can see a hand going up way over in the corner over there. And uh, apparently there's one in the middle, I've been told, over here or over there. Yes, exactly. So.
as the microphone. Let's start as the microphone there, number one, then number two. Please, you first, on that side first. Introduce yourself and be very quick if you can. Hello. My name is Shoaib Rahim from Afghanistan. Um, I'd like to make a comment and ask a question. My comment is, because of the trend against globalism, especially when we look at, uh, look at Brexit, look at President Trump's policies, look at anti-immigration European parties, do you think that we've reached a limit of uh, globalism and trying to help our neighbor when populations in those developed countries primarily want to be taken care of themselves before you reach out globally? Um, that's my question. Do you think we've reached a limit? Thank you. Um, there's a question over there, and then can we take the microphone to the lady there, please? Yep. <coughs> Thank you, moderator. <coughs> KP Fabian, former Indian ambassador to Qatar. We all talk about multipolarity, but I believe that there is an elephant in the room. And that is, in the international financial sector, there is unipolarity. Now, my question is to the president of the Wilson Center. This financial unipolarity, which also implies sanctions by the United States, is that good for the United States? Is that good for the rest of the world? And if it's not, what can we do about it? Thank you. Thank you. A very good and specific question. I think we have one more question here, and I might have to leave it there, although we'll take a fourth one right in the corner over there, and that'll be it. Yes, please, there. Kim Dozier from Time Magazine. I wanted to ask you to consider, is there anything positive from the recent U.S. policy pushing back um, on globalism? Have there been new centers of power formed, new nexi that could represent new decision-making opportunities? Very interesting question, whether there actually be new centers of power. I think there was a question, my last one was right in the corner there, the hand is up. Is there a microphone next to that gentleman there? Well, I have the microphone here. All oh, right, in that case, yeah. I'm the ambassador of the Dominican Republic. Hi, Robin, it's good to see you again. Um, 18 years ago, I was here to launch the Doha round. Today, we are regretting how the WTO ended up without an appellate body. Uh, trade is clearly the answer, as the chairman of the World Economic Forum has said. What do the speakers and, and the panel and the distinguished foreign minister think about the situation? And do we have the right governance without an appellate body? Is trade the answer when the institution doesn't work to resolve disputes? What are your thoughts? Thank you. Thank you. An important question. I'm sorry, but I must break it there in terms of questions. I want to give an opportunity to each of our uh, panelists to come in on at least one of those points, um, and I'm going to come in reverse order, I think, so we can finish up uh, with Sheikh Mohammed. Um, Olga, do you want to pick up uh, one or two of those points, the trend against globalism? Um, well, you, I, you probably have something to say about all of them, but you pick and choose. Thank you, Robin. Um, to pick up on the ambassador from Costa Rica, it's true. 2001, uh, we were in Doha, um, and uh, we um, were then hoping for a Doha development round, that's almost 20 years ago, uh, did not um, happen. Um, but I think we will have to uh, look at uh, trade in a more holistic way moving um, forward. And that is also related to globalization. Because if you look at the overall numbers globally, um, trade and globalization has led to a historic um, reduction and eradication of poverty. But inside countries, you have seen a growth in inequality, especially some developed economies that have got competition in traditionally protected areas. But there, I think, uh, countries also have to use the domestic tools that are available. The demonstrations we've seen in Bogota, in Santiago, um, also in Beirut and etc., is also uh, related to questions about governance. I think governments really need to go back to what governments are supposed to do. They're supposed to look at jobs, housing, good governance, fighting corruption, and all those traditional issues, and also look at taxes. 
Of course, if you want to invest in housing, if you want to invest in ed education and infrastructure, you have to have also a tax system that works. And um, I think this is partly um, um, the answer. On um, the new uh, geopolitical situation we are faced with, it is maybe a multipolar one, but it's also a multi-conceptual one. There are different uh, ideologies out there on how you're going to run countries and uh, how you want to run the world. And how do we deal with that? Do we have global values? I think through the UN and through UN charters, we do have also values that are not Western values. These are global values. Values related to gender equality, values uh, related also to equal opportunities for all people um, on our uh, planet. So uh, these um, are important discussions also uh, to take uh, when we're moving um, into a, a more and true uh, multipolar world. And, and in a one sentence answer, since the US uh, has been pulling back somewhat from his leadership position. Have, do you think governance ideas are getting stronger and more creative, or you th do you think things are becoming more negative? Simple answer, not a long one. From your World Economic Forum stance. I think in general it is in the world's interest that uh, the U.S. as the world's largest economy with 22% of the global GDP, 5% uh, of the global population, close to 45% of the global military capacity is involved also in world politics. And, um, but uh, we also need checks and balances. Uh, I think that's um, crucial. That's why we talk about this G2 concept, but maybe a G3, or uh, even better, uh, the concept of the United Nations. Thank you. Jane, over to you. A couple straight to you. Yeah, so let me answer the question that was posed to me about financial unipolarity. Is that our new system or is that our system? Uh, my answer to that is, uh, if it was our system, that system is under challenge. Uh, the dollar may no longer be the universal uh, currency, but also the challenge from China is uh, basically a, a different, uh, from a different economic system. And I don't think we should assume uh, that financial unipolarity will survive. I also am disappointed to see my government not filling the vacancies in the WTO uh, judges. I would think a better approach would be to make the WTO work better. It was a good idea and it should be uh, reinvigorated. I think that's true for all these international institutions. The other comment I'd make is to Kim Dozier's question on uh, uh, the push, it, are there new centers of power from the push against globalization? Yes. Uh, what, what we should be learning is, I think, that, that protests uh, and populism are a new form of, or a very effective form of exercising power given all the social media that we have. Power is now uh, bottom up, not top down. And that is both a challenge and an opportunity. And bottom-up challenges, like the challenge to uh, our complacency on, on uh, climate change, uh, will possibly get world attention. Time magazine, that you just wrote a good article in, seems to think so, uh, by, by naming its cover person a 16-year-old who is outspoken. And so I think the answer to you is yes, and it could go in a good direction. Um, thank you very much, James. Mr. Mohammed. Um, I want to just pull back to something that Borga Brandi said, that governments need to get back to doing what they do, most importantly, which is providing good opportunities, fighting corruption, good tax, giving opportunities to their citizens. A lot of your commentary was about the injustices of the international system. But do you feel that governments in Africa, members of the African Union, also take sufficiently seriously their responsibility to deliver good opportunities to their citizens? Um, because in the end, I'm afraid the tradition of governments all over the world often is to look after themselves and not look after their citizens. How do you, I mean, do you feel that Africa is also, and African nations are taking more responsibility for their own future? Uh, la, la nouvelle gouvernance est une exigence pour tout le monde, et particulièrement pour les États africains, qui doivent bien gérer sur le plan politique et sur le plan économique leurs États. 
Ça, c'est quelque chose sur lequel nous avons des stratégies et des progrès évidents sont en train d'être faits dans le continent africain. Je pense que la gouvernance mondiale et le multilatéralisme sont une nécessité. Pour nous, ils sont imparfaits. Mais les remettre en cause par des politiques isolationnistes et hégémonistes est encore plus grave. Il y a une nécessité. Pour la paix, il y a une nécessité du multilatéralisme. Je vois en face de moi M. Irekat, Mme Hanan Ashraoui. La question palestinienne, prendre des décisions unilatérales sur une question comme celle-là, est absolument injuste et ça n'aide pas à la paix ni à la stabilité dans le monde. La lutte contre le terrorisme, il faut également des coalitions mondiales pour pouvoir faire face, y compris en Afrique. Sur les questions de développement, sur les questions commerciales, il faut plus d'équité. On ne peut pas imposer des règles unilatérales et vouloir de la paix et de la stabilité dans le monde. Ceci est également évident dans le changement climatique. On ne peut pas se soustraire à ces obligations dans un monde qui change et qui change à vie d'œil, si on veut conforter la paix, la sécurité, et je suis d'accord avec vous, il faut commencer par soi et il faut mieux gérer, je dirais même mieux gérer sa misère. Merci. Thank you very much. Um, Sheikh Mohammed, I want to give you the last word. I mean, you may want to pick up on any of the questions you heard there, but I'd also like, as, as host of the 2019 Forum, um, if you reimagine governance and you were here in five years' time, what would you most like to see being different? You know, what, if there were one thing that you've been thinking about or your colleagues have been thinking about that you'd like to see being different about governance, what would you hope it might be? Well, I think that uh, what, we, what we would like to see is, is really a, a bottom-up approach, as I just mentioned uh, earlier, because if we have an effective regional mechanisms, that will build up on uh, a proper global governance system. And this maybe answers to some of the comments of, of uh, our participants today when uh, he was mentioning about the limits of globalizations and the issues of refugees, which really uh, ignited a national problems for, for the countries. We believe if there were an effective regional uh, mechanisms in place, that address the challenges in, in those countries with conflicts, we wouldn't reach to the level of having this issue of, of, of refugees. If these regional mechanisms worked well, it means that the global and the, the United Nations mechanism would also be working effectively. We believe everything is, is really interconnected here. And we need to understand how to balance between the national and international interests, because also we cannot ignore the fact that there are national interests for those countries made them uh, seeing that the international mechanisms are not working for them and not serving these, these interests. Uh, last but not least, uh, there is no uh, regional or international accountability mechanism that's binding and makes sure that the countries are abiding to the agreements that uh, uh, other countries are, are, are agreeing together on. So uh, we believe to summarize it, building stronger, a stronger regional mechanism is, is an important thing. Uh, looking at and reviewing the current uh, structure of, of the international community and the way it operates, balancing between the challenges in, in these mechanisms. And last but not least, how we are making these uh, uh, arrangements binding for all the countries and holding them accountable if they are violating these, these principles. Thank you very much for those comments. I think if I was going to take one takeaway or one synopsis of the points we've just heard here, from my view, top-down change may be very difficult to drive in the coming years. It's a very competitive environment. Uh, and difficult, therefore, for nations to, to really come together and change the structures uh, that Mr. Mohammed, amongst others, was pointing out are so unfair. But at the popular level, the demand for opportunity is just, you, you cannot avoid it. It is being heard all over the world today in the streets. And that leaves us at this business where you ended. Can regional levels perhaps come together and help national governments 
pick up their capacity for the more bottom-up approach that both you and Jane Harmon and others, or the multi-stakeholder approach that obviously the World Economic Forum very much promotes. So I think somewhere in here is the synthesis of what we should all be talking about over the coming uh, two days of this forum. Could you please give a very strong hand to our four panelists and uh, let's go forth and be productive.